Like the vast majority of such pleas, her letter was slipped into a small rectangular folder at the Department of Justice and tagged with a reference number, in this case, number 120074. No action in response was ever recorded. Her letter lies today in the National Archives. And again, I would note the date, 1903 of that letter. One might ask what relevance there could be to California and current legislative actions it could undertake in the sad story of a kidnapping in Georgia 118 years ago. No part of that incident occurred in California. There was no fault of the state of California in those events. No one could argue that, one could argue that the entire question of racial discrimination against African Americans in the United States during that period was irrelevant somehow to California. There were fewer than 8,000 black people, barely half of 1% of the total population living in the entire state at the time of Carrie Kinsey's letter to President Roosevelt. Moreover, one might say, why would California consider legislation addressing the legacy of slavery, given that the American system of chattel enslavement was never legally enshrined in your state? which had existed as a part of the United States for fewer than 20 years at the time of slavery's abolition and the 13th Amendment. In my remarks today, I will offer some possible answers to those questions and share some of my findings after many years of attempting to understand how, how and why involuntary servitude continued to be a significant element of American life long after slavery's ostensible abolition and how the continuation of forced labor practices ultimately injured millions of black citizens and others in some parts of our country deep into the 20th century and continue to shape the contours of American life even today. First, I should quickly summarize uh, the history and narratives contained in my book and the subsequent documentary film, Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black People in America from the Civil War to World War II. It, recount, it recounts how involuntary servitude was resurrected after the Civil War, first through the judicial system and then metastasizing through all of Southern society, how this system of what I call neo-slavery flourished with, with force and brutality in varying ways that circumscribed the lives of millions of African Americans deep into the 20th century and encouraged the spread of white supremacist beliefs and devastating racial discrimination by white Americans in every region of our country. That grim story unfolds through the experiences I documented of thousands of African Americans who experienced what became one of the most terrible chapters in the American history of abuse of its own citizens. The, the central figure in the, the central figure in my book is an obscure black man named Green Cottenham, who was born to two formerly enslaved African-Americans in a family that had spent generations on a cotton farm in central Alabama. Many of them descended from a man born in Africa in 1802 before being kidnapped into slavery and shipped across the Atlantic. On March 30th, 1908, Green Cottenham was arrested by the sheriff of Shelby County, Alabama, and charged with vagrancy. He had committed no true crime. Floyd was a new and flimsy concoction dredged up from legal obscurity at the end of the 19th century by the state legislatures of Alabama and other Southern states. It was capriciously enforced by local sheriffs and constables, adjudicated by mayors and notaries public, recorded haphazardly or not at all, and most tellingly in a time of massive unemployment among all Southern men, was reserved almost exclusively for black men. Cottenham's offense, his true offense, was that he was black. After three days behind bars, the 22-year-old man was found guilty in a swift appearance before the county judge and immediately sentenced to a 30-day term of hard labor. Unable to pay the fees assessed on every prisoner in those days, fees to the sheriff, the deputy, the court clerk, the witnesses who testified, Cottenham's sentence was extended to nearly a year of hard labor. The next day, he was sold. Under a standing arrangement between the county 
and a vast subsidiary of the Industrial North, U.S. Steel Corporation, the sheriff turned the young man over to the company for the duration of his sentence. In return, that company gave the county $12 a month to pay off Cottenham's fine and fees. What they did with Cottenham and thousands of other black men they purchased from sheriffs across Alabama was entirely up to them. A few hours later, he was plunged into the darkness of a mine called Slope Number 12, one, one shaft in a vast labyrinth on the edge of Birmingham known as the Pratt Mines. And there, as, as was the case with hundreds of other prisoners who had arrived under similar circumstances, he was treated with extraordinary brutality, subjected to starvation conditions, almost no health care of any kind, and no assurance, no reasonable assurance that he would, in fact, ever be able to leave this place. The, it was a location where waves, <clears throat> where waves of disease ripped through the population. Uh, in the month before he arrived, pneumonia and tuberculosis had sickened dozens of other prisoners. Within his first four weeks, six died. Before the year was over, almost 60 men forced into slope number 12 were dead of disease, accidents, or homicide. Most of their broken bodies, along with hundreds of others before and after, were dumped into shallow graves scattered among the refuse of the mine. Others were incinerated in nearby ovens used to blast millions of tons of coal brought to the surface uh, and essential to U.S. Steel's production of iron. Forty-five years after President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, Green Cottenham and more than a thousand other black men toiled under the lash at slope number 12. Imprisoned in what was then the most advanced city of the South, guarded by whipping bosses employed by the most iconic example of the modern corporation, they were slaves in all but name. Cottenham became one of hundreds of thousands of African Americans compelled into servitude through corrupt local courts, kidnapping, terror, and economic manipulation. Everywhere in the South, in the decades after the Civil War, whites resisted the full citizenship promised to formerly enslaved African Americans and waged a relentless campaign to recreate economic systems that looked as close to slavery as possible. Sweeping laws were passed designed to criminalize black life itself, used to intimidate black men away from political participation. Those who resisted were often compelled through the courts into slave mines or forced labor camps. Judges and sheriffs stole tens of thousands of black convicts, including huge numbers who had committed no true crimes, to corporate prison mines, quarries, timber camps, railroads, farms. They allowed their neighbors and political supporters to acquire still more laborers directly from their courtrooms. And as more and more African-American men and a smaller number of whites and African-American women were forced into labor in this way, the old business systems of slavery reappeared. Soon, white thugs were patrolling the back roads of the South, seizing African-Americans and selling them to the highest bidders, often with no pretense of court involvement. In some isolated areas of the South, black families began to wonder out loud in letters that they wrote and sent to others decades after the Civil War whether the old institutions of slavery had been officially reinstated. For a long time, American historians treated this aspect of our history cautiously. They largely accepted that what was written in the official records of these places was reliable, that in fact, the system of imprisonment may have been cruel, but that the people who were being held there were actually criminals, had committed actual injuries against society, deserved to be imprisoned even if the treatment that they received was too harsh. The belief was widespread that even though there were many indications of the innocence of thousands of these individuals, that there was really no way a century later to determine whether these convictions were legitimate or if these debts created by their convictions had been used to fraudulently entrap them in a new system of forced labor. What I found as I began to research this, and I wanna be observant of the time and, and wrap up very quickly. Um, as I began to research this, I realized that in fact, it was possible to probe deeply into the surviving records of local courts, small cities, counties, and rural areas 
that there were places all over the South where the records of that period of time, in fact, remained abundant. And what I found in the course of, of searching through what were ultimately millions of entries, certainly many hundreds of thousands of entries in that documentary record, was a system of a forced labor system of ruthless oppression and monotonous enormity. The, the, the arrests were on the basis of largely invented in crimes and crimes written specifically to intimidate African-Americans, such as changing employers without permission, vagrancy, walking along railroad lines, engaging in sexual activity or loud talk with white women. Uh, and, and the response from, from white Southerners uh, was to were massive arrests over and over again, timed to correspond with the labor needs of either agriculture in the South or the growing industrial base of the South. I'm going to stop from the uh, and, and stop here in just a second. The other area that uh, that if I had a little more time, we could talk through, and that's certainly worthy of of examination, is the degree to which that these practices and the ideas uh, which accompanied them and which were used to justify uh, these astonishing abuses of African Americans in the South, which is where the vast majority of the black population in the United States remained all the way through 1900, but these abuses. Uh, and the logic behind them, as well as the economic injuries that they created for African-American families that, that continued to, to damage those families generation after generation, all of those injuries, all of, that, all of the terrible thinking that just, attempted to justify it in some way, were all elements of our culture and economic realities that then spread across the rest of the United States as both the African-American population and many others moved further and further to the West and in larger and larger numbers. And as I'm sure many of you are familiar, uh, it was also the case that while there had not been a substantial African-American population in what is now California prior to the Civil War or for several decades after that, it's still the case that through the peonage system, uh, which still existed and thrived in California and New Mexico and other areas uh, which had uh, been a part of Mexico prior to the uh, becoming a part of the United States, but the system of peonage, another form of forced labor and debt slavery, uh, which had been made illegal in the United States shortly after the Civil War, was also another vehicle of forced labor uh, that, in fact, uh, was was highly prevalent uh, in California and and other parts of the West in that same period of time. And so, while California is a place that, as you all know, of course. Uh, slavery did not exist in the way that we understand it most commonly uh, in the United States. The repercussions and the legacies of the damage that was done both by slavery before the Civil War and then these many generations of what constituted an apartheid system, uh, that, that, that all of these dimensions of the American economic system and the political system and the political repression uh, that was enforced through these economic abuses, as well as mob violence and the other things that we're more familiar with, all of these forces uh, levered against the aspirations uh, and the abilities to pursue the American dream, to use the cliche uh, of African Americans, both while they were in the South and as they, in, in subsequent generations, moved into other parts of, of America, and in, including California. So I'll stop with my, my remarks right there, but but with the final thought of it's it's incredibly commendable that the legislature of California has taken upon itself, particularly given some of the background that I've just said, uh, to to begin this examination and to look into this issue. And I, I hope that uh, I look forward to learning more about the uh, the findings of your inquiry in the in months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Blackman, for your expert testimony. Uh, we will now turn to our next expert, Professor uh, Parman. You are recognized. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you and contribute to the really important work that you're tasked with. My remarks are going to focus on the Great Migration from my perspective as an academic economist. I received my PhD from Northwestern University in Economics. I've taught at UC Davis in their econ department. I'm now at William & Mary. Um, my research focuses on the relationships between education, health, and race, largely in the early 20th century, with multiple projects directly related to the Great Migration. 
I want to emphasize that my comments will focus squarely on the scholarship of economists regarding the Great Migration. The details I offer are an incomplete story without the contributions of sociologists, historians, political scientists, journalists, and importantly, the lived experiences of the individuals who took part in the Great Migration. These are all viewpoints I know the task force is gathering. The work I will highlight sheds light on very specific pieces of African-American economic outcomes, but the way those pieces fit into a whole is a complex story beyond the scope of this testimony. The economics literature on the Great Migration has been steadily expanding, particularly in the last decade. This growth is due in part to newly available data sets, but also to a gradual, though certainly incomplete, shift in the profession for studying a more diverse set of experiences in the United States economic development. I want to emphasize that economists' knowledge of the Great Migration is certainly incomplete and steadily evolving. In my remaining time, I will outline the most recent attempts of economists to understand the economic forces driving the decisions of African Americans to migrate, the outcomes of those migrants in their new towns and cities, and the ways those cities evolved as a consequence of the inflows of migrants. While much of the decision to migrate out of the South was certainly related to the pervasive and institutionalized discrimination of Jim Crow, economic opportunity played a clear role in the timing and the geography of the Great Migration. The early waves of migrants were attracted north, in part by the increased demand for workers to meet the industrial production needs of World War I. Increasing employment opportunities in sectors such as manufacturing would continue to draw workers out of the South through the middle of the 20th century. The geographic distribution of these economic opportunities, in conjunction with the layout of the existing transportation networks, strongly influenced patterns of outmigration. This is clearly seen in the case of California, where migrants were drawn heavily from the states along the Southern Pacific sunset route. In 1950, over 40% of California's African-American population was born in either Texas or Louisiana. While transportation networks heavily influenced the initial connections between sending and receiving states, these connections were then reinforced by the social networks that provided information to family back home in the South, and assistance navigating local labor and housing markets for subsequent waves of migrants. Ebbs and flows in the rate of migration through these networks was driven in part by fluctuations in economic conditions throughout the South. Downturns in the agricultural sector, most famously the devastation of the boll weevil, were particularly predictive of increased outmigration from different states. In the middle of the Great Migration, over one-third of African-American males in the South were farmers or farm laborers. Contrast this with the occupational distribution for African Americans in California at the same time, in which only 5% remained in farming, with far more individuals working in the skilled trades and the service sector. It was not simply this change in job opportunities that led to brighter economic prospects outside of the South. Educational opportunities were better as well. Spending on public schools was higher outside of the South. In 1960, California school expenditures per pupil were 27% higher than those in Texas, 14% higher than those in Louisiana, and almost 90% higher than those in Arkansas. These are the three states that contributed the most migrants to California during the Great Migration. The impacts of these differences in overall spending were compounded by underinvestment in black schools relative to white schools and the segregated public school systems of the South. Clearly, the Great Migration led to a substantial increase in educational opportunities, something visible in far higher high school graduation rates for African Americans in the receiving states relative to the South. Returning to my earlier comparison, 85% of African-American males born in California in the 1940s graduated high school. That figure is 76% for Texas, 68% for Louisiana, and only 67% for Arkansas. The move from labor markets and schools of the South to those of the North and West did indeed improve economic outcome. Average incomes for employed black males in California were nearly double those in the South in 1950 and would still be 55% higher in 1970. Despite these large gains, though, for migration, the earnings gap between African-American and white individuals remained large by the end of the Great Migration. There are a variety of reasons this was the case. First, the same economic opportunity that drew African-Americans to the cities of the Northeast, Midwest, and West drew white Southerners as well. These white migrants similarly saw their educational and economic outcomes improve. Second, upon migration, African-Americans still faced substantial discrimination in labor markets. Early waves of migrants often found that high paying jobs were unavailable to them and faced low paying, unskilled work and unemployment. Indeed, part of the delay in the initial migration of black Southerners north was the preference among employers for hiring white European immigrants over African Americans. 
Job opportunities for African Americans remained very constrained until the flow of European immigration was severely restricted in the 1920s. As the decades progressed, discrimination would continue to depress the wages of African Americans relative to whites. Due to racial discrimination in hiring, additional arrivals of African American workers competed amongst each other for jobs, not necessarily against white workers. Consequently, additional arrivals of African Americans in Northern cities had minimal impacts on white wages, but significant negative impacts on black wages. Finally, the responses of local residents and governments to the Great Migration also contributed directly to the persistence of black-white earning gaps. With the arrival of African Americans, white residents responded by moving to the suburbs and later the exurbs of cities. Estimates suggest that in northern cities, each black arrival led to 2.7 white departures from the city. Through the 40s, 50s, and 60s, cities became increasingly segregated, with black populations concentrated in city centers surrounded by largely white suburbs. Los Angeles provides a clear example. By 1970, despite an overall African-American population share of 11%, the typical black individual in Los Angeles lived in a census tract that was 72% African-American. This choice to move to the suburbs was not necessarily available to black residents. Racially restrictive housing covenants, discriminatory zoning ordinances, lending policies, including those of the Federal Housing Administration, and more informal forms of discrimination kept black families from living in these neighborhoods and utilizing the amenities they provided, particularly well-funded public schools. As responses to the Great Migration led to segregation, black households were faced with declining house values, de facto segregated schools, and decreased access to jobs and public goods. These factors have all contributed to lower rates of upward economic mobility in recent decades for those cities that had the largest inflows of black residents during the Great Migration. These long-run economic consequences of the Great Migration are relevant to any discussion of reparations. The economic history of the Great Migration is one of an African-American population going to great lengths to further their economic and social position. It's an example of precisely the type of individual initiative, industriousness, and perseverance that underpin those notions of an American dream. However, it reveals the formal and informal constraints that limited the economic opportunity available to African-Americans despite that drive. In that respect, the Great Migration provides a cautionary note that regardless of the desire of reparations recipients to make lasting improvements to their lives and those of future generations, any success in doing so will be constrained by the persistence and the evolution of discrimination in schooling, housing markets, labor markets, and beyond. The case of the Great Migration highlights that reparations should be considered in conjunction with continued effort to eliminate discrimination in all the various arenas that govern economic outcomes. Without doing this, they will likely disappoint their proponents and provide a straw man for their critics. Reparations alone cannot correct for centuries of economic disadvantage unless the structures that perpetuate that disadvantage well after, as long as the structures that perpetuate that disadvantage well after emancipation continue to exist and to evolve. Um, with that, those are the comments I've prepared and I look forward to any and all questions from the task force. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Parman, for your expert testimony. At this time, we'll move to our next expert witness, uh, Ms. Isabel Wilkerson. For more, I think Ms. Wilkerson is still logging on. Perhaps we can move to Professor Hudson, who is next on our testimony list. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Hudson, you are recognized and you may begin your expert testimony. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all about this important issue. I'm going to focus my talk today, my comments, on the violence that great migration families experienced in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s as a, re as a result oftentimes of their success in the kinds of endeavors that Professor Parman was just speaking about in the job market um, and issues around housing. My, my comments today focus on the racial terror that African Americans experienced in California in the 1940s and 50s and beyond, and mostly I'll talk today about Southern California families, though the kinds of the acts of violence that I'll be describing happened across the state. Uh, this testimony that I'm giving is based on my research that I did on racial terror in, for my book, West of Jim Crow. 
I'm going to be focusing on the Ku Klux Klan in California. And it's important to say that while the Klan might be one of the most visible groups that attacked black homeowners, black workers, and black families in California, just one group that terrorized black Californians, and there would be many other offshoots of the Klan on white supremacist groups uh, that would do the work of segregation and white supremacy. But I'll be focusing my comments today on the Klan. Now, when we think about the Ku Klux Klan, in spite of much evidence to the contrary, I think Americans still tend to focus on the Klan of the South and the Klan of the 19th century that was formed in Reconstruction to do exactly the kinds of things that Doug Blackman's work has shown us, which is to keep African Americans in a state of terror uh, as close to slavery as possible. However, the second Klan, as it's called usually, of the 1920s was a Klan that was especially strong in the Midwest and in the West and in California. By 1921, the Los Angeles Examiner and the black newspaper, the California Eagle, announced that the Klan had arrived in Los Angeles. The fledgling branch of the LA NAACP was quick to note the dangers that were coming with the Klan, and Charlotta Bass, publisher of the Eagle, was uh, would be one of the most important uh, watchdogs of the Klan in California. She would regularly publish in the pages of her newspaper any, any information that she could get about the doings of the Klan in and around Southern California. Now, the extent of the Klan's popularity in Southern California, which is where they first organized, was revealed in 1922 when the LA County District Attorney raided the headquarters of the Klan in downtown LA. What they found was staggering. There were over 3,000 Klan members in LA County alone, and law enforcement from nearly every city in the state appeared on the list of Klansmen's, the, sorry, the lists of Klansmen that were confiscated from those headquarters. There were, for example, 25 San Francisco policemen named on the membership lists. These membership lists were printed in newspapers across the state and cities up and down California scrambled to address the fact that their city offices were filled with members of the Klan. Now, one would think that this kind of exposure would shut down the terrorist group. But in fact, as the end of local NAACP noted, when they wrote to the headquarters, the Klan continued to operate in and across Southern California as if the raid had never happened and the exposure. In fact, recruiting events and parades were hosted by the Riverside Klan, the Anaheim Klan, the Oakland Klan, and on and on. Now, the 1930s is a time when we think that the Klan kind of disappeared in the United States, partly because of the rhetoric coming out of Germany, um, and the unpopularity of this kind of white supremacist extreme rhetoric. It's true that a lot of members disbanded, a lot of chapters disbanded, and people couldn't pay their dues during the Great Depression. Um, but that never happened, it never disappeared in California. And I think this is something that I wanted to emphasize here today, which is California was one of the few states that continued to have an active Klan throughout the era. They marched regularly in downtown Los Angeles and continued to recruit members up and down the state. Now, on to the Great Migration. As you know from previous testimony and from uh, the other days you've had of hearings, the Great Migration, of course, attracted thousands and thousands of African Americans to the state, hoping for better jobs, education, opp and opportunities of all kinds, the kinds of things that Professor Parman has just been speaking about. Few of those migra great migration families thought that they would encounter the racial terror that we associate with the South, namely the Klan. But this influx of migrants, and particularly the presence of black vets of World War II and black homeowners was deeply disturbing to white supremacists in the state. Some moved to action. Now, one of the most devastating examples of Klan violence is the story of O'Day Short, and I want to just tell you this story briefly during my time. 
O.J. Short was uh, a refrigeration engineer who in 1945 purchased five, a five acre plot within the city limits of Fontana. Now many African Americans like Short had been attracted and drawn to Fontana for jobs in Kaiser's new steel manufacture plant. These were good jobs. Uh, this, of course, African Americans were also flocking to Richmond in Northern California for jobs in, with Kaiser. Now, the Shorts were the first black family. This was O'Day Short, his wife, and two children. They were the first black family to move into the city limits. Most African Americans had been pushed below, as they said, Baseline Street in a black segregated neighborhood. As soon as the Shorts moved in, they were threatened by two deputy sheriffs who visited the property and told Short that he was out of bounds. Subsequently, the real estate agent who had show, sold Old Day Short the property visited and told Short, we had a meeting about your case. If I were you, I'd get my family off this property at once. Now, at this point, O'Day Short took very calculated actions and he reported this visit to his attorney and to the black press. The San, Los Angeles Sentinel, a black newspaper, published an exclusive front page interview with O'Day Short under a banner headline, they recounted Short's encounter with the vigilantes and his dangerous predicament. Short's attorney, Ivan Johnson, was the law partner of Lauren Miller. Miller had recently been leading the legal charge against restrictive covenants, a well-known attorney in California. Ten days after the Sentinel published this threat, the story about the threat O'Day Short received, the Short's home burst into flames. The fire that engulfed the property began with an explosion and neighbors rushed to the scene. Helen, the wife and two children, were, as well as O'Day Short, were rushed off to the hospital. But the little girl, Carol Ann, died 15 minutes after they were admitted to Southern Permanente Hospital. The son, Barry, died the next morning, Monday morning, and their mother, Helen, died that same day on Monday. As soon as the flames subsided, there were multiple theories about how the flame, how this explosion started and a massive cover-up of evidence. While the local NAACP immediately opened an investigation and the black press, including the California Eagle and the Sentinel, were on the scene interviewing neighbors and witnesses, it was clear to the members of the community that this murder was being covered up. O'Day Short died on January 21st, almost immediately after the district attorney told him that his wife and children had died. His murder and that of his family became the subject of a grand jury investigation, but the results were inconclusive. Members of the NAACP, the labor movement, the black press continued to demand justice, but to no avail. The LA Sentinel described the situation this way. One thing, sorry, Jim Crow had kept short from finding a home in Los Angeles. Jim Crow had cast him in the role of a violator of community traditions if he built a house on the lot he purchased. Jim Crow had warped the sense of duty of deputy sheriffs to the extent that they themselves had joined in a plan to deprive an American citizen of his constitutional rights. All the shorts are dead. Only Jim Crow is alive. Now, this was not the only case of terror that African-American families experienced in the 1940s and 50s. It's one of the most dramatic. But the 1946, the situation in Los Angeles was exploding. A flaming cross was placed on the lawn in front of the Hickerson family in South Central LA. The Hickersons had lived in the house for two years and had been waging a court battle against restrictive covenants. They were the only African-Americans on their block. The police called the cross burning incident a childish prank. That same year, the LA, um, sorry, a fiery cross was burned in front of the Jewish fraternity at USC. College students also found KKK burned into their lawn. That same fraternity had also recently signed a petition against the use of restrictive covenants. Two days later, a cross burned in front of Paul Aubrey's home on East 58th Drive in Los Angeles, and he too was fighting a restrictive covenant case. 
and there are several other examples. For the most part, the mayor of LA did nothing, and these uh, attacks continued throughout the 50s. The assault on Southern California great migration families by the Klan and aided by police departments, real estate brokers, and federal loan programs paved the way for segregated neighborhoods that languished without city services. Although the Klan violence peaked in 1946 and it, it never returned to that level, in some ways it became superfluous as new groups formed the core of the backlash against the black freedom struggle. And I'm speaking now about the many white supremacist groups that proliferated after Brown versus Board of Education, after the much publicized March on Washington, sit-in movements, SNCC, et cetera. But it's important to emphasize that while it might look different, this kind of violence continued well past 1946. The perpetrators of the violence didn't always wear white hoods, but they were very clear on who they were attacking. And black homeowners in particular formed the core of, these, of this group. The white supremacist violence of the 1940s found new expression across the country and in California after Brown versus Board and in Fontana as well. The backlash against school desegregation and the concomitant revival of the Klan became so successful in Fontana that by 1965, President Lyndon Johnson ordered an investigation into Fontana's Klan activities. Two years earlier, in 1963, an African-American captain in the U.S. Air Force bought a house in San Bernardino only to watch it destroyed by arsonists before he and his family could move in. Little had changed in the 17 years since the murder of the Shorts. The Golden State had long punished African-Americans who dared to challenge segregation and some paid with their lives. And again, I've given you examples that took place largely in Southern California, but what I wanna emphasize is when I was doing my research, research on Klan violence, using the records of the NAACP regional office that are located at the Bancroft Library at University of California, Berkeley, and also the NAACP records of the Library of Congress, I found just as many examples of violence against great migration families that were perpetrated by the Klan and other white supremacist groups that took place in the Bay Area, that took place farther north and farther south in San Diego. I, I focus today my comments on Southern California, just to keep my comments brief. And I also wanna emphasize what I said at the beginning of my testimony, which is while I focused on a group that's re readily visible and known to Americans, the KKK, and I have done that intentionally because it has so often been assumed that that kind of group did not operate in California. It's also the case that many other groups who are not as visible and not as well known were also targeting black homeowners, successful African-Americans and African-Americans who are challenging the kind of restrictive covenants and segregation of white supremacist practices in the state. Thank you for this opportunity to share this research with all of you, and I look forward to comments and questions, and I wish you um, all the best with this important work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hudson, for your expert testimony. We will now recognize uh, our next expert, Ms. Isabel Wilkerson. Welcome. You're recognized, and you can begin your expert testimony when you're ready. Thank you so very much. I am Isabel Wilkerson, the author of The Warmth of Other Sons and Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents. I am the daughter of survivors of Jim Crow. I am a daughter of the Great Migration. My parents grew up under formal segregation in the racial caste system of the American South. And my ancestors before them were either born into Jim Crow or into enslavement. I am the direct descendant of the history and legacy of both suffering and strength of trauma and transcendence. I was raised directly by people who defected the Jim Crow South to pursue their dreams in the North during the Great Migration, only to find themselves further suppressed by redlining and restrictive covenants 
and de facto segregation in the place of refuge. I am testifying because not enough Americans know the true and full history of our country or the origins of the divisions that we now face and thus of the karmic, social, and economic indebtedness to African Americans that the country has inherited. I believe that knowing our country's history is the first step toward overcoming the challenges we face as a nation. It was my honor and privilege to be tutored in the lived experience of what African Americans endured in the 20th century when I interviewed and talked with more than 1,200 people across the country who participated in the Great Migration, including hundreds uh, that I spoke to who migrated to California. The Great Migration was the mass relocation of six million African Americans from the Jim Crow South to the cities of the North and West from World War I until the 1970s. It was the only time in American history that American citizens had to flee the land of their birth just to be recognized as the citizens that they had always been. No other group of Americans has had to act like immigrants in order to be recognized as citizens. This migration, like other migrations in human history, was, uh, was not about geography. It was about freedom and how far people are willing to go to achieve it. It is a measure of the repression that they were facing uh, in the South, that they were willing to journey across the country farther than some current day immigrants in search of freedom, in, in search of the freedom that was denied them in the region of their birth. This was a seeking of political asylum within the borders of one's own country. They were fleeing a caste system known as Jim Crow. It was an artificial hierarchy in which everything that you could and could not do was based upon what you looked like, your perceived identity, and your assigned location within that hierarchy. This caste system was so arcane and repressive that it was against the law for a black person and a white person to merely play checkers together in Birmingham. You could go to jail if you were caught playing checkers with a person of a different race. This caste system was so tightly devised that in courtrooms throughout the South, there was actually a black Bible and an altogether separate white Bible to swear to tell the truth on in court. The very word of God was segregated in the caste system of the Jim Crow South. This was the concept of purity versus pollution that is a hallmark of caste and which extended into every sphere of life. The majority of black people who have ever lived in this country were excluded from the body politic, excluded from the economy that depended upon them, consigned to the lowliest and most dangerous work, consigned to hard labor or servitude and openly underpaid in the 20th century if paid at all, especially under the institution of sharecropping. This artificial hierarchy required a tremendous amount of violence to sustain, such that every four days an African American was lynched for some perceived breach of the protocols of caste in the first four decades of the 20th century. As Black Southerners made their way out of that world, they followed three beautifully predictable streams as in any migration throughout human history. The East Coast stream carried people from Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas, and Virginia, to Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, and on up the East Coast. The Midwest stream carried people from Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, and Arkansas to Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and the entire Midwest. And then there was the West Coast stream, which carried people from Louisiana and Texas out to California and the entire West Coast. It was a redistribution of an entire people. Before the Great Migration began, 90% of all African Americans were living in, nearly held captive in the South. By the time the Great Migration was over in the 1970s, nearly half of all African Americans were living outside of the South. This was the first time in American history that the lowest caste people signaled en masse that they had options and were willing to take them. That had not happened in the three centuries that African Americans had been on the soil by that time. It had not happened in the 12 generations of enslavement that preceded nearly a century of Jim Crow. How many greats do you have to add to the word grandparent to begin to conceive of how long enslavement lasted in the United States? Let me put enslavement in perspective. Enslavement was the systematic dehumanization of an entire people the conversion of human beings into commodities, the holding hostage of an entire people for the enrichment of others and of the country. 
enforced with a level of brutality that many Americans have not had a chance to learn of, a level of enforcement that would have been in violation of the Geneva Convention had it applied to African Americans. Slavery lasted for so long, and again, this is the uh, precursor of the world in which we live today, a precursor of Jim Crow, and a precursor of many of the divisions we live with. Slavery lasted for so long that it will not be until next year, 2022, that the United States will have been a free and independent nation for as long as slavery lasted on this soil. No adult alive today will be alive at the point at which African Americans will have been free for as long as African Americans were enslaved. That will not happen until the year 2111. It will not be until the year 2111 that African Americans will reach parity between slavery and freedom. We need to remember that the earliest waves of black Southerners to arrive in the North and West were recruited to the North and West to fill labor shortages in the steel mills, factories, and shipyards. But it turned out that the North wanted the labor, but did not want the people. How exactly do you do that? The response of the Great Migration and these receiving stations of the North and West was to build structural barriers of exclusion, of restrictive covenants, which forbade even those white people who might have wanted to sell to black people from doing so. The response the, to the Great Migration was to institute redlining and mortgage lending, which denied federally backed mortgages in any neighborhood in which black people lived, thus excluding by law and by policy the parents grandparents or great-grandparents of most every African-American alive today from the greatest source of family wealth in this country, from home ownership, from the American dream itself. It is this exclusion from the generational wealth that arises from home ownership that accounts in large part for the racial wealth gap in which white people whose ancestors were the beneficiaries of these exclusionary policies have 10 times the wealth of black Americans, a wealth gap that one study showed would take at the current rate 228 years to close, 228 years. Thus the caste system followed the migrants wherever they went and became not merely a Southern phenomenon, but a national one. As in other states and cities, even after restrictive covenants were struck down and co as co unconstitutional at mid-century, white residents of Los Angeles resisted black incursions into the strongholds of Glendale, Canoga Park, Hawthorne, and most of San Fernando Valley. There in the valley suburb of Pacoima, a World War II veteran, Emery Hestis Holmes, moved his family into a three-bedroom home in 1959 and faced a relentless campaign to force them out. The white neighbors, according to the historian Josh Sides and news reports, bombarded them with phone calls in the middle of the night, harassed them with nonstop visits from random delivery services that they hadn't asked for, repairmen and exterminators they hadn't called, and taxis that they had not ordered. They threw rocks into their windows, left tacks in their driveway, sent a hearse to pick up, quote unquote, the deceased. They burned a cross on their lawn and spray painted their garage with the words, black cancer lives here, don't let this spread. This was in 1959 within the lifespan of millions of people alive today. The Holmeses stayed Holmes sued the neighbors and went on to become a housing rights activist and a founder of the San Fernando Valley Fair Housing Council. He had fled Jim Crow only, have, only to have to fight James Crow in California. The Great Migration was the first time in American history that the lowest caste people such as Holmes actually had the chance to choose for themselves what they would do with their God-given talents and where they would pursue them. Think about those cotton fields and those rice plantations and those sugar plantations and those tobacco fields. On those sugar plantations and tobacco fields and rice plantations and cotton fields were opera singers, jazz musicians, playwrights, novelists, surgeons, attorneys, professors, accountants, legislators. And how do we know that? We know that because that is what they and their children and their grandchildren and now great-grandchildren have often chosen to become 
once they had the chance to choose for themselves what they would do with their God-given talents. The majority of African Americans in the North, the Midwest, and the West are descendants of the Great Migration, but the people who made the migration did not often talk about the traumas of Jim Crow. It is a measure of all that they suffered that they very rarely spoke of the world that they had escaped. When they left, they left for good. They did not look back. It was too painful to do so. They didn't want to burden their children with what they had endured, the repression, the dehumanization, the dangers that they had lived under. When people seek to deny the harm suffered by African Americans at the hands of the state, they often dismiss slavery as a long ago grievance. When in fact, not only do we currently live with the unaddressed history of slavery, we do not have to go back to slavery to document the exclusion, inequities, and brutalities African Americans have endured. Much of the harm and exclusion of African Americans happen within the lifespan of people alive today. The story of African Americans has been an ongoing fight for recognition of one's humanity and citizenship, a constant pressing against the wind to rise above the station to which African Americans have been confined, meaning the bottom of the caste system, the bottom of a caste system that they did not create, did not wish to be a part of, and have sought to escape from the very beginning. I believe reparations are a natural and necessary part of the country's reckoning with its history, of coming to terms with the consequences of a history that still plagues us as a nation, and which has frayed the social fabric and harms every single citizen, whether they realize it or not. Whenever people talk to me about their response to my work, they usually say, I had no idea. I had no idea that this happened in our country. I had no idea that this happened in the region in which I lived. I had no idea that this happened so recently. I had no idea. Not having an idea has consequences. It affects how people vote, where they choose to live, whom they choose to hire or to grant a mortgage, where they send their children to school, where they and the country invest its resources or withhold its resources. I believe that we need a massive education effort and an honest and robust truth and reconciliation commitment to lay bare the true history of this country so that every citizen can know the ways in which the state has systematically favored some groups and excluded others, and why reparations are a long overdue part of any serious effort to heal our country, to atone for the past and, to, for, the past and for current injustices, and to rectify continuing disparities. I believe that if the majority of Americans knew the true full history of what was sacrificed to create this country, they would be calling for reparations themselves. Thank you so much for inviting me to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilkerson, for your moving expert testimony. I would now like to recognize Bertha Gorman for her personal testimony. And Ms. Gorman, you can begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for saying. And I am just so thrilled to have heard Isabel Wilkerson. That was phenomenal. I've just read her books, and uh, it is she, she is just a treasure. I also am so grateful to the this distinguished group on the reparations. And I would like to say good morning to each of you. I'm Bertha Gaffney Gorman, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to tell my family's story. I hope our story will further the understanding of the legacy of harm the PTSD that our people uh, suffer caused by my ancestors and their descendants as a result of their enslavement in South Carolina and in Texas and the dis discrimination that followed them from Texas to New Mexico to California. My paternal family's enslavement can be traced back to the early 1800s to Charleston, South Carolina, where they were enslaved by white Irish immigrants whose family came to New York in 1797. Records show that Peter and Martha Gaffney owned slaves in New York, but left the city 
when slavery was officially ended there and moved to Charleston, South Carolina, where slavery was in full force. They already were rich when they arrived in South Carolina, having made their fortune in mercantile in New York. In South Carolina, they expanded their wealth when they, with the ownership of humans, they profit from their for, from their labor of the enslaved people who work for them and whose labor they contracted out and whose bodies they sold. A few years before the beginning of the Civil War, the Gaffners decided again to leave South Carolina for Texas. They sold off many of the people they own in preparation for the move to Red River County in East Texas. The plan, as I understand it, was that Martha would go ahead by train with some of their finest furnishings and with their about 20 plus slaves for the purpose of setting up the home, starting their businesses and their move to Red River County in East Texas. Uh, Peter would stay behind to settle their affairs, which included selling off property and the remaining people that they own or enslaved. However, Peter Gaffney never made it to Texas. He engaged in a duel and was killed, and Martha Gaffney settled in Texas alone. Among the slaves taken to Texas by Martha Gaffney were my parents, my paternal great-great-grandparents, Samuel and Sophia. According to my dad, one of Samuel's brothers was sold down, down river, as they said, during the transition, but escaped and found his way to his family in Texas years later. Now in Texas, Martha brought a lot of land because they were rich in a rural area outside a town called Clarksville that is noted then and today for its hanging tree that stood in the middle of the town square. This is the area where I was born in 1940. My dad's father was born in Texas one year after the declaration of the de facto slavery that followed the June 19th announcement. My father was born 47 years after slavery, and my mother was born in 1916, barely 50 years after slavery. I never observed the 4th of July until I came to California in 1959. My family support, uh, celebrated Juneteenth, that it, as it's called now. So I grew up listening to the stories, and the stories of my parents, and of my grandparents, and of my great-grandparents of their experiences as enslaved people. The black people who lived in the uh, communities outside of Clarksville where my family was settled shared a common reality, hard work, poverty, and brutality. They also shared a common fear that their future and that of their children would be the same. The Emancipation Proclamation signed by President Lincoln and General Order Number Three, General Order Number Three, that was delivered to the slaveholders in 1965, were precognitive of what was to come. Both established the relationship between slave owners, slave former slaveholders, and former enslaved people would be that between employer and hired labor. They both warned that free people could not engage in vagrancy they would be with the threat that they would be arrested and put to jail. So what did this mean for my family and others like them? So uh, seldom having left the area where they were born, lived and worked all of their lives, these free, these free, free people knew little of opportunities outside their own community and their own situation. So they continued to work for their enslavers, to live in the same shacks and to experience the same cruelties and control. My family was given a small part, uh, plot of land at the end of slavery. These communities still exist, inhabited by the descendants of the enslaved, including members of my own family. I believe, as my dad did and his father before him, that the U.S. government was complicit in continuing slavery in Texas for a number of reasons. As to the claim that the soldiers were needed to keep the peace, they believed and witnessed that black people had no choice but to stay in place in Texas. When they tried to leave, they were brought back and punished as vagrants and as vagrants and criminals. And they were often beaten, jailed, or both. 
So even though my ancestors were free on paper, they were not in reality. I remember the whispered and frightening stories of beatings, castrations, and hangings. I remember my father and other males hiding in storm cellars and in the woods because the Klan was riding. There were stories of children who were born of rapers, rapes and illegal rape, uh, relationships. In fact, one of my cousins, who became the largest landowner in the area, uh, inherited his white father's land, and he had to leave because of it. My father only went to the uh, third grade, but he was intelligent and highly skilled in mechanics, farming, and animal hus husbandry. In 1948, our family moved to Commerce to work the, uh, a, a well-known farm there still is called Aberwich Ranch, which is about 70 miles east of uh, Clarksville. Jim Clark hired him out to teach classes in animal husbandry at the Agricultural Co Co uh, College, which is now Texas A&M in Cummins, where he was paid as a field hand. In my, mind, in my mind, Texas remained hateful and cruel. The hanging tree was a constant reminder to black people of what happened or what would happen to them if they stepped out of their place. I know from my parents that an uncle was castrated for alleging having sex with a white woman. I know for a fact that my brother was beaten for staying on the sidewalks when a white woman passed. He was 16 years old. Because the land we lived on was considered private, the government provided no school, no services, no health care, or even cemeteries for our dead. Former slaves built one room schoolhouse that my parents attended. And they attend, and, and that I attended only uh, sporadically. They paid the salary and room and board for a teacher. They had to because it was not provided to them. When the family were unable to pay a teacher, there was no school. I did not attend school regularly until I was almost nine years old. I was taught to read by my mom. The school stands, still stands in the community as a church. The families, including mine, we donate annually to care for the cemetery and the graves of our ancestors. I attended school for the first time when I was nine years old and my family moved to Commerce, Texas, where I attended the segregated black school with no electricity, running water, or indoor plumbing until 1953 when a new school was built. But the teachers were caring, caring and, to the, and very concerned with the education of black children. So in that way, I was very very lucky. My father was unable to sustain the family above po poverty because of the economic negativity bred by the post-slavery culture. Although my grandparents and parents were hard workers and landowners who grew and raised their own food, the systems required them to buy on credit food staples, seeds, farming equipment, clothing, and tools from the company store owned by whites. The debt was due when the crops were harvested, after which there was very little money left, and the process of credit began all over again. The form of economics negatively impacted our education as well. As children, we were critical to the harvesting and were unable to attend school until after the, the crops were gathered, sometimes as late as November and December. The hanging tree continues as a living symbol of racism and hatred in Clarksville. The tree was there when I was a child, and it was there when I visited in 2018. We lived three miles outside of the town of Commerce and often walked to and from school, and white kids would drive out in their trucks hurling rocks and, and insults at us. To avoid, to avoid them, we walked through the wooded areas, and one day one of my sisters fell through a rotted board in an abandoned well and almost drowned. We were able to save her. My brother was beaten, as I said earlier, because he did not move off the sidewalk for a white woman. We moved to New Mexico in 1956, where we had no relatives and there were barely 100 black people in the town, but our opportunities were actually much better. I was able to attend a well-equipped school. My classmates were First Nation or Indian people, whites, Mexicans, and a very few black kids. But it was a very tight knit school and a very tight knit community, I should say. I was an honor student throughout the school, uh, my high school, and Owls was still a working farm 
but my father was paid better and our living standards were improved. And so we were okay in a way. However, ever, all of the teachers in the school were white and racist, racism among them was prevalent. I wrote a story for an English class and the white male teacher gave me an F and accused me of plagiarism in front of the class, though he never told me or explained what it was I was supposed to have plagiarized. My brother, who was in the same class with me, punched the teacher and was kicked out of school. Had we been in Texas, my, prob my brother probably would have been killed or severely beaten by whites for hitting a white man. My par parents continued to carry the Texas fear, and my brother had to leave. Although I was an honor student throughout high school and the teachers in New Mexico never spoke to me, the teachers never spoke to me about college or about scholarships or any of those things. I traveled uh, interstate on the Greyhound bus twice in my life, once to visit my uncle in Denver and the second time to move to California. I traveled alone to Denver when I was 16 years old and I had to sit in the back of the bus. I could not sit or eat inside the bus station and I had to get food through a window in the back and eat outside. There were, uh, there were colored only signs and white only signs, as well as no N-word signs posted all over the place. And all of the toilets were on, out in an outside uh, outhouse away from the bus station. After graduating high school in New Mexico in 1955, I worked in the local, tech, uh, a local, local cleaners, I'm sorry, for the summer to earn money to, for the bus trip to Sacramento. I came because of City College and because I was told by my auntie that it was free. I only had to pay for books and $3 per unit. My first job in California was as a babysitter. I lost that job when I signed up to take a test for a clerk position with the state of California. But I was not allowed to take the test. It was 1959 and I was given every imaginable excuse they they weren't given the given the test. They had already given the test. They lost my application. The fact is, I was never able to take a test for a clerk. I continued at City College, went to a business school, got a uh, certificate as a early contometer operator. That's something you never hear about any any uh, any at any time. But my point and and my closing, I think I'm closer to my ten minutes, was that at every step of the way in my growth and in my career and in my education, I have experienced discrimination, pay inequities, sexism, sexual harassment, you name it. Um, I landed a temporary job, for example, no test was required, and this was with the state of California calculating state employees' contributions to the social security system. I was highly recommended to take the job as a supervisor because my boss, who was a white woman, felt that I was the most qualified to do, to do so. The director told her that I was hired until I went in to meet him, at which time he decided and told her in front of me that he couldn't hire me as a supervisor. I was too young. I didn't have enough experience. I'm not taking the exam and no one would accept me as a supervisor. But then he offered, you can stay on until I find someone else. And so being my mother, my father's daughter, I walked. I was the first black woman hired at the Wonder Bakery. You see the signs here in Sacramento for those who live here. The job paid well, but the atmosphere was toxic. I, I, I was on my way to work when I heard that John F. Kennedy had been shot, I was devastated. And when I walked into the office, my wife supervisor said, did you hear that a nigger lover, that that nigger lover was killed and he was shot by a nigger and she laughed. Well, you know, Tom is a he dog. So later she was killed in an accident and I was given her position, which drew the outrage of a white male colleague in Sacramento after ranting that I didn't deserve the job, job because I was an unqualified affirmative action hire. He let me know that you got the job, but I'm still free white in 21. My life changed with the EOP program at Sacramento State College, which allowed me to go back and do what I really wanted to do, which was to study journalism. I quit my job at Wanda Bakery and enrolled full-time at Sac State, 
work part time at, at Sacramento Bee as a as an intern and raised two small children. I, in 1970, I was offered an opportunity to study at the University of Uppsala in Sweden, and I took it, which was one of the best things that I could have done for myself and my children. When I was returned, I was hired at the B full time as a full, first full time black African American woman on the, as a writer. The interesting thing about the Sacramento Bee, and I and I loved being a reporter, was that. Speaking of the Ku Klux Klan, I had done a special story going, traveling the South, writing about uh, the South after Martin Luther King. I interviewed David Duke. When I came back, I showed my photos to the photo editor at the Sacramento Bee, and he looked at David Duke's photos and he said, I always knew that young man was going to be great. Now, all of my life, I lived in Oak Park a black community here in Sacramento. I, I lived there because, because of housing discrimination and the inability for black people to, to choose where they wanted to live that did not occur until the uh, passing of the Rump of Fair Housing Act. I believe it was 1963, 64. I don't quite remember for sure. But we had no choice except to live in Oak Park and, and Del Peso Heights and then later Glen Elder and several other communities that still tend to be uh, predominantly black, except for Oak Park, which has been totally gentrified. The house where I raised my kids on 33rd Street in Oak Park, most people cannot afford to live there anymore. And certainly black people would not be able to move there. That, has, that is how much change has occurred. Um, I'm going to end there. Um, I, this has been a very emotional memory trip for me. I really want to uh, open, I am open to responding to your questions. I have, I've listened to several of the sessions and I have been so impressed. The work that you're doing is absolutely wonderful and I absolutely applaud you for the efforts and I'm really looking forward to seeing the outcome of it. Um, so that's my personal story. Thank you, Ms. Gorman, for offering your personal testimony. It was incredibly moving and I learned a lot. So thank you very much. Um, at this time, it's 1215 and we will now turn to the task force who will have the opportunity to ask questions and provide comments to those who have uh, provided expert and personal testimony today. I'll lead this discussion. I would like to um, turn to Ms. Gorman. Um, I have a question for you. Um, ideally, what would an ideal reparations package look like for you um, to account for everything that you and your family has gone through in this country and in this state? I believe that the most what my father and my and my mom and others in my family always emphasized was the importance one that education was really key. The other was um, home ownership, that you have to buy a piece of land, that you've got to own something. To me, um, the a, a reparation for my family, I'm blessed. My boys are both well educated and 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 professional. So. My, I have four grandchildren who all have graduated university, major universities. But for going forward, I think it, it would be critical to be able to provide free education through at least community college and at least provide interest free loans for graduate studies or, or, or doctorate uh, studies or have a person want to be, but also for a person who wishes not maybe to go to college, but would like instead to study a craft, that they would have the same opportunity that is provided by the government. Healthcare, I think, is critical. Those things will continue to be on our, our radar. And I think those are the kinds of things that are absolutely must be supported by just our people as a, as a whole. Education, healthcare, um, Financial security, how do you gain that? It means that we need support. So many of our people need that support in order to get into home ownership. Equity. So 
I, I know that's sort of all over the place. And I, I would, if I, could, if I may, I'll share this with you. One of the things that happened when I went to Sweden, and that was in 1970, the first thing I received was a health care card for me and my kids. That was the same thing every other immigrant, every super Swedish citizen also received universal health care. So there was never any concern about that. The other thing that was amazing to me was every parent was given a monthly allowance to ensure that you could provide what your child needed. Now, some people didn't understand, didn't get the memo and they got into serious trouble. But if, if your child was seen outside without the proper winter coat on, you could be brought to task. A third thing that I really found there that I think would be good for our country and everybody, and if everyone benefits, maybe unlike the mass, they'll support it. And that is housing for elderly. So that they did, there was no worry about people getting old and not having a place to live. And finally, I'll say this that I was really impressed with because as a single mother, I was divorced, raising my two sons alone. There was childcare. And the childcare was even provided on Saturday because as a working mom, as a student and working and so forth, well, mothers sometimes need a break. And the child care, I could send my kids to play with the, the kitty set in a safe space on Saturday. So those are some of the things I would like to see that our people have access to. I, you know, I don't know how, it, I think it's possible actually. It's just, well, where do we get the will to make it happen? Thank you for that uh, robust response. I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Gorman. Um, at this time, I would like to recognize any task for, any other task force members who would like to provide a comment or question at this time. I'm not able to see everyone on the screen, so if you would like to be recognized, just feel free to speak up. Hi, I'm gonna jump in. This is Lisa Holder, a member of the task force. I'm overwhelmed. Um, I just found your scholarship and your personal stories to be so illuminating, so insightful, um, and so uh, authentic and genuine. So I, I, I appreciate you so much. I'm so impressed by you, and I'm so happy that um, you're being educated. Um, by people with such profound skills about our history. Um, one of the things that I would ask you as, as, a, as, a, as a group, um, the five of you, I mean, collectively, you have so much brilliance and so much experience with scholarship and research. Now, one of the, one of the powers that this body has is the power, is subpoena power. We haven't talked about that, but that is, that is a critical power that allows us to subpoena information. I know that many of you as researchers would probably love to have that kind of judicial um, sort of backing that would allow you to literally send out interrogatories to institutions um, and, uh, and government and private equity and say, give me your papers on this issue. Um, and so I want us as a body to effectively utilize that awesome subpoena power. So I'm asking you to give us some insight as brilliant researchers as how you would exercise that subpoena power in gathering information from different industries and institutions um, that would inform this study of reparation. Well, uh, uh, well, go ahead, Isabel. Okay. Um, I believe that because this is fairly recent, um, we're talking about 1968 was the Fair Housing uh, Act. Uh, we're talking 1964 and 65, the Civil Rights Legislation of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65. Um, one of the things that I would be interested in is to go back to those realtors 
to go back to the bankers, uh, to go back to uh, the school boards, the people who were in a position to enact and to enforce uh, these discriminatory uh, laws and customs and protocols. Um, these are the, the people would still be alive. There, there are many, many people who very likely would still be alive. Um, this is this is one area where we'd be able to go back and recreate uh, to be able to build upon our understanding of what happened. Um, that's one reason why I'm in favor of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission overall, because the people who were participants on all sides of this uh, need to be able to come forward and to uh, speak about what happened, to testify about what happened um, before it's too late. I would also say, I wanted to also add that uh, the hospitals, because of the tremendous uh, discrimination um, in the medical field where study after study after study has found that uh, current day uh, medical professionals, far too many still believe the fiction that black and brown people do not experience pain at the same degree that their white counterparts do. So there, you know, I, I would suggest that every single institution, every structure within the larger framework of our society uh, merits in, inspection. And if you have subpoena power, then that means that you can call upon each of these industries, each of these institutions, and um, have them uh, uh, express a kind of accounting of what's happened and their and their participation in all of this. Thank you. My experience also has been that for some reason people think that this is so far away that it doesn't merit discussion or that it's history. And, and an example is I was working on a project with the NAACP a number of years ago. And there was a young man there who we were talking about the, I believe it was the 50th, 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act or the Civil Rights Act. I'm not sure exactly which one, but, <clears throat> and he said, we've got to get to those people because they're going to, they're all dying out. And I said, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. So there is that feeling that this is history and it is history, but there are people who still are alive, who are active and who have memories of those days and of what happened and what their families went through. So I agree with you. I think that's a wonderful idea. I would I would encourage the same ideas that Isabel suggested and also that uh, Lynn Hudson and some of the research that she's talked about these more recent events. Um, I think that it would take some uh, sort of strategic inquiry to figure out how best to target uh, your subpoena power uses, but um, I'm certain that there are there would be employers um, that could be from whom records could be sought that where where there's reason to believe that substantial numbers of people were affected by discriminatory policies and very likely ones that were even illegal at the time. Uh, you know that that policies that continued deep into the 1960s and into the 1970s. Uh, um, and I mean, there's been many. There's been a lot of litigation in which uh, or attempted litigation in which uh, uh, discriminated against parties uh, would have liked to have been able to uh, have the kind of subpoena power that you have uh, already. And so I think that that makes absolute sense. And uh, and what Ms. Gorman was just saying about this sense of distance, uh, this false sense of distance is a very important thing. And uh, uh, these kinds of conversations are so important to that. I know that Isabel's experience is uh, even more so than mine of uh, it's extraordinary when you're out talking to the public about these kinds of things, the people who come up to you afterwards and uh, and begin to say that, well, oh, yes, now, I've, now I finally understand that memory I've always carried of the thing that happened one night after in 1948 or 1946, you know, when my brother came back from service and we all we were all scurried out of the house and, and rushed to a train stop in the dark of the night uh, and I didn't understand because I was only six or I was only 10 you know but now I, I understand and this whole notion that that Isabel has been so important uh, in in helping everyone to understand of the the role of sharecropping as a not just as an unpleasant experience for so many people but as a de facto form of forced labor for for so many 
uh, it would become difficult to to find the targets of subpoena power uh, around some of those events because they're so informal and the entities don't exist anymore and the people who were doing them may be gone. But in terms of events and and police agencies uh, of the of the 1960s, I would think there would be some real and the Tulsa race massacre investigations that uh, that you know, back in the 90s when uh, when uh, Dr. Charles Ogletree at Harvard, you know, led the a process of uh, of um, of determining very empirically what had happened in Tulsa in 1921, uh, it was ultimately access to some of the records that should have been public to begin with of the state police and the Tulsa pol city police that was really important. So I, I do think that it, it's it um, you'll end up subpoenaing everyone on the landscape uh, if uh, if you're not careful, but with some targeted work. Uh, I'm sure you can identify some very useful uh, targets uh, of, of that of subpoena power. I'd, I'd like to offer one more target that didn't come up in this conversation, I think likely because of you know, compressed time, but economic development. Um, so this is an area where, you know, where black owned businesses could exist, could not exist, and how land was redeveloped. I think there's certainly going to be valuable information that exists about what guided those decisions and what sort of long-term impacts that had. And I think that information on some of those things have, are not that far distanced. You know, for example, when you look at what happened with gentrification and Oak, Oak Park, the community I spoke about earlier, as a child, it was a booming business center. And now what has occurred is the same areas that were business centers when it was a black community are again a business center, except they're not black. And that happens, I think, in many cities throughout the throughout the country that, um, you know, they, they allow the cities to, de, uh, to totally disintegrate, move the people out, and then the next thing you know, it's a lovely little walk-in community with dogs and baby strollers. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. I had a follow-up question for Professor Parman. So um, I had a chance to read um, all of the meeting materials and you know, in the meeting materials and in your um, opening remarks today, you concluded by saying, reparations cannot correct for centuries of economic disadvantage if the structures that perpetuated that disadvantage well after emancipation continue to exist. So my question is, can you expand on this proposition? Um, I'm, I'm intellectually curious about um, your work on, on that part and what those structures may be um, and any suggestions for how you know, we can um, fix sure. them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> suggestions to fix. I'm not certain I've got any magic answers there, but yeah. speaking, yeah. speaking about what what you know my intent there was you know focusing on something like say this enormous wealth gap that would take generations to close i mean even taking generations to close if these issues with discrimination in the housing market and issues with sort of racial disparities in how lands redeveloped um, including with local government action if that's not fixed even providing initial say housing wealth will not have sustained kind of ability to close that gap because those types of institutions will once again erode that wealth, right? So I think it takes sort of a constant vigilance to see not just what past policies um, contribute to the gap, but how policies have continually adapted in ways that have disadvantaged the black community. And I think that's what you see kind of in the wake of the civil rights movement. That's what you see when you can no longer write racial covenants into deeds, but instead they're replaced with other language about minimum, you know, structure size, only single family homes that are designed to accomplish the same goals. So it's sort of keeping an eye out for how policies evolve in ways that are still targeting the same group. Um, if it's not a constant attention to that, then any one-time transfer will not have kind of the lasting consequences across generations. Um, you know, just one other example that comes to mind, because this is something we deal with as an institution here at William & Mary and in higher education, 
you know, providing access to higher education does not change the demographics of the professors that those students get to interact with, right? And that's like an additional important component. And so even if you find ways to provide grants, find ways to get students sort of on the radar of schools and attending those schools, it's only in conjunction with also doing different efforts within the institution to diversify the professorship that those impacts are really going to kind of have the results you want. Um, so, so I think that's another example of, of where I think, you know, we can't limit ourselves to focusing on one resource or one transfer. It, it has to be done in conjunction with these other changes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Parmer. Ms. Gorman? I say I'm going to dare to disagree with him, and uh, and only be from experience. My parents never owned a house other than the small plant of a plot of land that would get deeded to them that we never lived on after we left Texas. I am a homeowner. I've always been a homeowner. Both my sons are, are homeowners. So are 80% of the people in my family homeowners. There is a strategic planning that has to go along with it. And it can be done. Other groups have done it. We can do it. I think it's just one. But when you say, well, you've got to do this, it's going to take this long, it's going to take 200 years. Yeah, that makes it a little bit difficult. But once you understand that it can be done, which is one of the things I really appreciate about my family, is those, yes, we're descendants of slaves. But it doesn't mean that we can't do this stuff and that. So I, in that way, I think it's a frame of mind. I think it's looking at what is, and not always going through the system, but how do you do that? And I do think it can be, because I know too many people who have come through that and who now are doing exactly that. So I disagree with you. With respect. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. Um, I had a question, a two-part question for Ms. Wilkerson. So um, the first part of my question, I would like for you to speak on uh, and, and illuminate to the public for educational purposes, the Green Book, right? Um, and, and what that meant to uh, Black families migrating from the South to California. And then also, you know, having the a, a pleasure of, of reading your book, Cast, I, I had a question, and, and pairing that with my own personal knowledge with international law, you know, under international law, reparations comes in five forms, which include compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, uh, satisfaction, and then lastly, um, and more pertinently, guarantees of non-repetition which is a guarantee from the state or any institution um, that's implicated to guarantee to stop harming the victim group. So my, my other question to you is, um, you know, do you have any thoughts or would you like to expand upon, because you already hinted on it, but do you have any thoughts on how to ensure that the caste system in this country is uh, finally eradicated? Thank you. Well, um... Thank you for those questions. Um, in order to understand the meaning of the, of the Green Book, one has to first um, also understand what it was like to be African American throughout the majority of the time that there's been the United States, um, but particularly, uh, you know, once um, motoring became possible for any American and to recognize what it meant. I mean, you know, there were sundown towns throughout this country where black people, if they were making their way uh, making road trips, they could not be um, seen in those uh, cities after after sunset. Uh, there were uh, restrictions everywhere they went. There were uh, in in every single state. There were uh, there were uh, segregated hotels. There were segregated restaurants. Um, and this might have been formal in the in the South, but then informal uh, in the rest of the country. And if you were African American, you did not know exactly where you might be be welcomed or turned away um, outside of the South. And so people, it was a perilous uh, journey, if you can imagine, because first of all, people, you know, had some of the cars were older, they could break down, there was no guarantee that they'd be able to get help, no guarantee that be able to get 
uh, any help with a uh, overheating radiator. Uh, they ran out of gas. I mean, it was a, uh, it was uh, like going out in into the wild with no no way of being assured of help at any point. And um, because of the essentially the the the, wor the country was closed off to black people um, in terms of what it meant to just take a trip, a road trip. And so there were certain things that black families did. I mean, one of the things that people would do, and I think many, many people, many uh, children of the great migration can recall that their parents would wake them up, you know, in, in the middle of the night, it seemed, in order to make that trip back down south um, because they needed to be safe. They needed to, they wanted to get ahead uh, of, of whatever might be. They could be stopped on the road by the authorities. Uh, they could be asked what they're doing driving a car like that. There were perils at every turn. And so in order to wait, make their way through um, the country um, and to find places to eat, find places uh, where they could stay, they relied upon the Green Book, which was created by a man uh, who uh, named Victor Green in New York, who himself was having trouble when he, whenever he would travel. And um, his one of the beautiful things about uh, his the first uh, edition of that of the Green Book was that he said he, it was his fervent hope uh, that as he embarked upon this business that that the business would would uh, would no longer be necessary as soon as possible. You know, most business owners do not ever say that, and yet that was his fervent wish that the Green Book would no longer be necessary. Uh, and so the Green Book was a, a, a compilation, a directory of the places where a black person could safely, um, could, could plot their route in order to know where they could stay for the night, uh, where they could get uh, gas, where they could get a meal, uh, where they could rest. And we should remind people that these places were, uh, were uh, very, uh, they were they were not formal places. They were very informal. They were they were they might have been boarding houses. They may have been rooming houses. It might have been someone who just had you know opened up a room for for someone in in their uh, apartment. It just was it was very random. You didn't know what you were getting. Uh, many of the places were not. Uh, even in business by the time the Green Book came out because of the casual and formal nature of the network of places where people could stay. It was both a guidebook uh, and a, a comfort. Um, it was, you know, obviously this is long before the time of Google Maps and, you know, all the various things that we take for granted. I mean, it's actually, when you think about it, it's kind of terrifying. I mean, there were no cell phones. There was no guarantee of being able to make a phone call if you needed help. These were the, that was the era in which the, you know, the ancestors of many, many um, black people alive today were, were uh, living under. And so the Green Book was their, uh, their insurance um, that they might have a place to stay on the road. Uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to reparations, and I really appreciated your um, breakdown of the five parameters that need to be met. Um, and I completely 100% agree um, because one of my concerns about uh, about reparations or about uh, the response to reparations is is that uh, there would be resentment, there would be a lack of understanding as to why it's necessary. The majority of Americans do not learn the history that uh, that my colleague Doug Blackman has done and his brilliant work. The majority of people do not know uh, the things that many of us who spend so much time in this um, you know know in our bones. Uh, and of course, the things that uh, most every African American, because African Americans live this, uh, most many Americans do not know of that. And so, what I believe needs to happen is what is essential is to is to uh, along with the, the steps toward reparations and those five parameters would be to have um, education for uh, Americans so that they would understand uh, why this is necessary and understand. Uh, what happened to lead us to the world that we see today. And I think that without an education, without an understanding, I think that this could be seen as special favor, special treatment, special uh, compensation to people who already are seen as undeserving by nature, by the nature of the caste system that we're in, a group that's been separated from 
happening it would be seen as, as unworthy of anything that the country might uh, seek to do or that the state might seek to do so i think that education is absolutely necessary and i um, mentioned one other thing and that was that you know we need to get on the same page about what happened in our country um, i spent time looking at germany because germany has had to wrestle with and atone for the horrific history of the, of the Third Reich and of World War II. And of the many, many things that they have done, for one thing, when there are monuments, those monuments are, the, are to the people who suffered um, or uh, were killed as a result of, of what happened at that time. Uh, there are no monuments to the people who were the perpetrators of that horror. Um, there are no, there, 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 there is a ban on any uh, image any representation of the symbolism of that of that regime. Um, there are um, many many monuments and uh, and recognition of the contributions of and the uh, centrality of the people who perished in the Holocaust, so that everyone can know what um, you know what happened and and the role that they played and how this all happened. So that again, as you mentioned, this could never happen again. A guarantee that this would not happen again. And one of the ways that they do that is they've converted the places of horror into places of memory. And they have they have not erased the history. They have they teach the history. And people learn it. You know, students learn it from the earliest age where they can begin to understand why one person would be uh, opposed to another person. And and they and it continues on through their education. And I think that education is absolutely necessary in order for a reparations plan uh, to succeed in our country. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilkerson, for those answers to those two questions. I would now like to recognize Ms. Parliamentarian Johnson. Would you like to interject at this time? I just wanted to make sure you saw Mr. Lewis. I remember Lewis's hand was up. Yes, I was just about to recognize him. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Member Scott Lewis, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair Moore. Um, thank you, everybody, for your presentations. Uh, you know, Ms. Gorman, thank you for telling us your story and your family's story uh, this afternoon. Um, so I have two questions, Chair Moore, if I can ask uh, two questions. Um, the first is directed towards uh, Drs. Hudson, uh, Blackman, and Parman. The second is directed towards Ms. Wilkerson. Um, so the first question, you know, I want to, you know, recognize that in the presentations today, we've seen the sheer scope of the, the forms of injuries that African-Americans have faced in this country. Um, you know, however, what we see is that oftentimes we are looking for very convenient, uh, in many ways, you know, compact ways to give an accounting of the, it, experienced injury you know so we right now have heard a lot of discussion um, and a lot of emphasis on the racial wealth gap and what we realize is that the racial wealth gap is a means by which we are trying to you know effectively give some accounting for a whole scope of, of, of injuries that African Americans have been facing for centuries in this country so I would love to I would love to ask uh, the three of you, if you, you know, have given any thought or if you might have any recommendations about how we might find, say, better terminology, right, to represent the scope of injury, right? I think we, we've seen other programs that have, that have designated several injury areas, and COBRA has the five injury areas, et cetera. Um, However, we are dealing with uh, we're dealing with a kind of lived experience that sometimes requires uh, you know some kind of clarity, right? Some kind of, of conciseness in the language. And so I I just give you a moment while I ask uh, Ms. Wilkerson the question that I have for her to kind of think about if there's any language, if there's any framework that we might be able to incorporate in in order to kind of you know accommodate and account for the multiplicity of injuries that African Americans have faced in this country, right? Going from the issues of, of racial terror to gentrification, right? Um, that would be really helpful, I think, for us as we try and make our way through the myriad ways that African Americans, you know, have continued to experience the, in, the injuries um, and the various forms of disenfranchisement in, in the United States. Um, and so, Ms. Wilkerson, thank you very much, and thank you for your work. Um, you know, you made a statement earlier, and I, I might have missed it somewhat, but there was a statement that, that somewhat 
seem to look beyond the issue of geography in, in some of the aspirations of the people who you've researched, right? And the history that you've researched. Um, however, you know, we're dealing with, you know, as the, the, the California State Task Force, right? We are, we are dealing with a question that is inherently geographic, right? We're dealing with a question um, of, of, of belonging effectively. Um, a lot of you know, state organizers are trying to think very particularly about the geographic relations that you know, African-American people in this state have uh, to the very histories that you've, you've laid out and to the various injuries that all of you have mentioned today. And so I would just love for you to, and perhaps Ms. Gorman as well could give us a little bit of insight about how can we think about the kind of qualifications of belonging, of attachment uh, of black people to the state, right? So we heard yesterday um, from a gentleman who is a fifth generation Californian, right? We heard in public uh, comment today, uh, one individual who said that someone should be in the state at least five to seven years to qualify for reparation. So again, we're dealing with this issue of scope, right? How do we, how, how do we accommodate for belonging? Right, and therefore, uh, how do we accommodate for qualification uh, on the basis of these geographic relationships? And I think, you know, Ms. Wilkerson and Ms. Gorman, you both have, you know, your respective perspectives here that would give us a lot of insight as to how we can actually understand what it means to be black in California and what it means, therefore, to, to qualify for reparations from the state of California. Thank you. Um, I guess you wish for me to go first. <laughs> well, I, I, asked, uh, I asked the first question to, to give the first group some time to yeah. think. So I was going to ask you to go second, um, unless the first group, you know, needs some more time to consider and you will be gracious enough to go first. But by, by any means, whomever is, is prepared to, to answer, please feel free. I'd be happy to say a little bit on your first question. Um, so one thing that strikes me is we, we fall back on wealth and income because it's, it's easy for people to make comparisons, right? It's easy for people to comprehend that. And I think what's clear is that it's not specifically about your actual income, your actual wealth. It's just one of the, the few metrics we have that we think people have agreement on. But one of the things I mentioned you know, in my comments was what was driving people out of the South, certainly the bulk of it wasn't just finding a higher wage, right? It, it was the horrible living conditions in the South under Jim Crow and you know, the violence and, and all of that. And so I think you need to find a way where you can put a figure on that that people understand. And I think it still reverts back to things like income, but you have to think about it as, you know, it takes a pretty big income jump for other people to decide to move across your region, right? That's a huge thing to do to, to pull up your roots. And so I think you can find these alternative scenarios where that gives you a way to put a magnitude on on how bad the non-monetary conditions were in the South, right? If, if it takes a certain amount of income to get somebody else who's leaving kind of normal living conditions to move somewhere else, right? That gives you a lower bound on, on how painful that was. And I think another way to approach that with all these other injuries over time, all these other ways that discrimination has affected the African-American population, is turn to more modern data where we do have things like lawsuits. We do have things like settlements for issues that aren't just about income. They aren't just about wealth. But that gives a way to translate those types of injuries into this language that I think people have a better sense of how to compare across situations. Um, so, so that was just the, the first immediate thought that came to my head on that. If I could just jump in, because because. John, you made me think of something that I thought would be a great example. Um, one of the first black Californians to address this issue in courts, that is the damages of discrimination, was Mary Ellen Pleasant, the black abolitionist who sued the North Beach Mission Railroad Company, and in 1866 initially won her case, arguing that she suffered in mind and body from the discrimination of not being picked up as a black rider, even though she was at the corner with her ticket ready to pay um, again in 1866. She lost that on appeal. And I, I'm sure many of the lawyers in this group um, will know that, you know, it was it was deemed that it wasn't possible to measure the damages. So therefore she couldn't keep, you know, be rewarded $500 in damages. And that and that just made me think about 
you know, as you're saying, what, you know, how do you, how, how do we come up with another kind of, this is a great question, you know, another kind of way of measuring the damages of race, hate, discrimination, segregation. Um, you know, at first when you asked it, I fell back on it sort of historians like, well, there's social damage, political damage, cultural damage, um, economic damage. Maybe we could use those. Maybe that could be. But of course, they all overlap. Um, and that, and so that leaves us in a muddle again. And then, you know, I think very much about the excellent work by feminist scholars about intersectionality and the fantastic work of Movement for Black Lives that always reminds us that damages can always involve many categories. You could be discriminated against for being black and female and in, you know, poverty, working class. Um, so really, I can't, I can't answer this question, but um, I think it's a great one. I think it, because it involves so much overlap, um, maybe you just have to face that and just deal with that, you know, face that up front. But I'm, I wish I could more, be more helpful. Um, I would say that another metric that um, that has come up, but we haven't really explored as much as the, is the issue of health. Um, we're talking about wealth because that's easily measurable or it's e more, more easily measurable. Uh, and I think that data um, is really important in establishing uh, the parameters. And of course, there are many, many people who are doing research on this. This is not my area. The, 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 the calculation about what the, the debt is, the calculation about uh, the monetary aspects of this is not something that's my area. But um, I would say that we can, in some ways, if someone were really wanting to look at this, they, we could measure the damage in terms of health. Um, you know, African Americans, um, I would say especially African American health vis-a-vis -vis, uh, versus uh, the health of West Africans. Uh, I had the, the, the uh, I interviewed this man who was from Nigeria uh, he was in his 50s, and that was relevant. He was telling me about how he'd just come back uh, gotten, uh, from the doctor, and he'd gotten uh, the uh, diagnosis of diabetes and of high blood pressure. And he said it was very shocking to him because he he did not he did not expect that that would be the diagnosis. But also his father, who was in his 90s back in Nigeria, did not have high blood pressure did not have diabetes, he was quite healthy. And in other words, the son living in the United States as a black man, which is what, what, what he said, living in the United States for 30 years as a black man had, had literally uh, measurably affected his health to such a degree that he was in worse health than his own father. And a lot of the times when we talk about disparities in health, um, when we speak of uh, black people in this country, there's also, there's often this subtext that suggests that there's something that they're doing wrong, there's something that, you know, it has to do with uh, lifestyle or food or what, you know, whatever. Um, but there are many things that actually connect back to slavery. There are many things that collect, connect back to what does discrimination do to the human body? What does discrimination do to, it, it shortens the telomeres, that this is measurable effect, this is the measurable damage to, uh, to black people with their health. So I think that, you know, one of the things that I would include as part of the uh, as part of what would be folded into any reparations effort would be uh, the would be things having to do with health. I mean, when you think about the uh, contributions that enslaved people against their will made to our understanding of medicine, all of the experimentation on black people from uh, from enslaved women who were who uh, had who were had suffered surgeries without uh, anesthesia and without consent. Um, in the uh, in the uh, 1800s uh, during the time of enslavement, when you think about what happened in Tuskegee and everything in between, um, African Americans, it, it could be argued, should not have to face uh, additional costs to maintain their health because the health, uh, the, the poor health of many many Black people, is the result of the structure and of what I call the caste system of our country that has made it such that. Uh, people moving through the world, uh, you know, at the, in the subjugated group are treated in a certain way, are excluded in a certain way, 
uh, face pressures that, that may not be there for other people. Now, of course, everyone has health issues, but th we, these are measurable differences that I think are relevant in, in, as a metric in um, seeking to repair, because reparations is about repairing. It's about repairing. And one last thing about this is that the lifespan of black people um, is, of course, is, gener is lower um, than their white counterparts. And I want to emphasize white counterparts so that um, a, an, a college-educated black person will have a lower life expectancy than their white counterpart, uh, who is also a college graduate, but also has, there, there are some studies that show that, my, that, that black people who have an, uh, a college degree actually have a lower life expectancy than some white people with only a high school diploma. So these are measurable disparities that are matters of life and death, and that, that to me are just as important as um, the focus on wealth, which is important as well, of course. Thank you, Ms. Wilkerson. I would like to now uh, recognize Member Grills, who has a question. I think that Member Grills stepped away. Um, does any other task force members have a question or comment for our speakers today? I have a final question. I this, Tamaki, I uh, oh, I yeah. cannot. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Member Tamaki, you're recognized. Oh, you know, up to you, uh, uh, Moore. I'm glad. Go ahead. Thank you, Nakama. And I want to thank uh, each of the witnesses for their testimony. I really agree with Lisa Holder. I'm overwhelmed also uh, <clears throat> the the comprehensiveness of the oppression that you just summarized in a little bit is it's breathtaking and um, just a just a suggestion maybe for us as task force members that um, as we hear this powerful testimony I'm wondering if parts of it can end up in I'll call them mini documentaries where uh, we can more easily through social media and other ways amplify what each of you just talked about. Um, and not only the capturing of the personal stories, but the historical analysis and primarily connecting the dots between then and now, you know, the history that you've outlined, which is a horror show. And then the current impact, because I think as Elizabeth Wilkerson has said, uh, <clears throat> education is just critical. And we knew, need to do it in a way, of course, through uh, these hearings and listening sessions that we're going to have, but also um, in, in ways that we could circulate uh, snippets of your testimony, maybe the most salient and compelling parts on a specific topic. And <clears throat> maybe that could be part of the uh, product that the reparations uh, task force does. And, and maybe when we get to the point of of getting a communications expert uh, that could actually advise on how to, you know, get that out and distribute it. It could be through, you know, uh, schools, colleges, universities, uh, but faith community, uh, community organizations. So this is really bouncing around the environment. Your, you know, your um, statements, your your testimony. So I would just suggest that as a comment to us and. I want to thank each of the witnesses. Thank you so much. Tamaki, I see Member Grills is back on, so I wanted to give Member Grills an opportunity to ask a question if she would like to at this time. Um, thank you. I lost power. Um, I see what we're at or past time. So I will um, just perhaps after lunch when we come back, just for the record, state my questions because there's no way there's time to answer them at this point. Um, and perhaps those questions could be shared with our panelists in case they have thoughts they would like to share back at a later time. Okay, thank you. 
So at this time, it's 102. I would like to uh, thank on behalf of all of the task force members, uh, our expert testimony and our expert testimony um, providers and for Ms. Gorman who provided per personal testimony. We really appreciate uh, you all taking the time out of your busy schedules to provide um, some very you know, amazing information uh, um, and well needed information to task force members and the members of the public. So again, at this time, it's 103. We will convene to lunch, but I did want to um, ask the task force members now.